Who framed Roger Rabbit? That was the question on everyone's minds back in 1988. Directed by Robert Zemeckis and produced by Steven Spielberg, Who Framed Roger Rabbit was a milestone achievement in film technology and how it interacts live action footage with animation, creating a crazy world of the 1940s where both people and cartoon characters coexist. Who Framed Roger Rabbit tells the story of famous cartoon star Roger Rabbit who gets framed for murder. To help clear his name, he teams up with Eddie Valiant, played by Bob Hoskins, who is a disgruntled detective who has a short temper and no tolerance for tunes, as his brother was murdered by one. The murder setup turns out to be a scheme by the evil Judge Doom, played menacingly by Christopher Lloyd, who has an evil scheme to demolish Toontown, along with the public transit, so he can build a freeway. Despite the fact that this evil judge also doesn't like Toons and has a love for killing them in his toxic dip, in a twist it turns out that Doom himself is a Toon. Eddie must put aside his prejudices against Toons and work together alongside Roger in order to stop Judge Doom and save the day. So today, in celebration of this magical movie, we are going to explore 10 amazing facts about who framed Roger Rabbit, to peel back the layers to see if there is any information out there that we might not have previously known. So buckle up as we explore this well-loved movie. Let's check it out. Number 10, Bob Hoskins' Mental Health. In Who Framed Roger Rabbit, Bob Hoskins plays main human protagonist Eddie Valiant, a disgruntled private detective who doesn't like tunes very much. And Bob Hoskins was proud to star in the movie, as it was the first movie he starred in that his children were allowed to go and see, as beforehand he mainly starred in more grittier movies, often playing tough British gangsters. However, performing in Who Framed Roger Rabbit came at a cost. His sanity as due to the fact that a great deal of his co-stars were cartoons who were added in after filming, Hoskins had to get used to the habit of visualising and pretending to see his animated co-stars. And after doing this for eight months, he started to suffer hallucinations and was seeing cartoon characters all over the place. He spoke of one incident where he was speaking to a woman at an event and saw one of the weasels in her hat. So Bob Hoskins had to make believe that he was surrounded by cartoons. So much so that it affected his brain and he couldn't stop seeing them everywhere. That's pretty damn freaky when you think about it. Also, Hoskins claims that the design of Jessica Rabbit wasn't made until after the filming wrapped. So he just had to imagine what she would have looked like. But he said he didn't picture her as being as risque as she was in the film. That way. Going by the test footage, she was going to look a lot more scarier. Uh, and blue. Number 9, The Man Behind the Rabbit. Why don't you do right? Like some of the men do. The character of Roger Rabbit was played by Charles Fleischer. Please, don't worry. Whatever you say, yes ma'am. And he was so dedicated to his animated role that he even turned up on set in every take which featured his character and even delivered lines off screen for his fellow actors to work off. And if that wasn't dedication enough, he would even turn up on set in a Roger Rabbit costume. I guess he was just a committed actor who really wanted to feel the role. I'm just glad that the guy who voiced Baby Herman wasn't walking around the set in a nappy. Fleischer's most other notable roles include starring as a dream doctor in A Nightmare on Elm Street and appearing in heavy makeup in Back to the Future Part 2 as the guy who wanted money for the clock tower. And these days he's most well known for his stand-up comedy. Number 8. Based on a book. Who Framed Roger Rabbit is actually based on the book Who Censored Roger Rabbit, published in 1981 and written by Gary K. Wolf. The book is so drastically different from the movie, it's insane. For a start, the book is a lot more dark and grim than the movie. And also in the book, there is no Judge Doom. He was a character purely created for the movie. Instead, in the book, the main villain is a genie. Yeah, that's right, a genie. 
In the book, Roger is short and covered in brown fur. And also in the book, every time a toon talks in Who Censored Roger Rabbit, speech bubbles come from out of their mouths displaying the words of what they are saying. And what's even more surreal is in the book, toons can create their own double gangers out of their own mental energy to be used as their stunt doubles in cartoons to provide stunts that are too dangerous. The double gangers eventually disintegrate in time, and the double gangers are needed, as in the book, toons can die just as easily as humans, unlike the film where it's just dip that kills them. The biggest shock in regards to who censored Roger Rabbit is that Roger dies early in the book from getting shot, and Eddie Valiant teams up with Roger's double ganger, leaving them 48 hours to solve the murder before Roger's double ganger disintegrates, in an adventure that leads them to finding an ancient magic tea kettle, which turns out to be a genie's lamp, and houses a homicidal genie. There were two more subsequent books, including Who P -p -p Plugged Roger Rabbit and Who Whacked Roger Rabbit. Number seven, deleted scenes and characters. It's witchcraft, that crazy witchcraft. As with most films I talk about, there was indeed a fair share of deleted scenes associated with Who Framed Roger Rabbit. Most noticeably, the famous pig head scene, where Doom catches Valiant snooping around the Ink and Paint Club, only to leave him stranded in Toontown with a cartoon pig's head, leaving Valiant to believe that he has been turned into a toon. <laughs> I get why this was deleted. It kind of slows down the pace and it makes Valiant look kind of like a buffoon in thinking that he has somehow been converted into a cartoon. However, the scene turned up in many TV broadcasts of the movie, which was a weird practice which used to happen in the 80s and 90s. I can remember watching Who Framed Roger Rabbit on TV for the first time and getting confused as to where this scene came from and why it wasn't in the home video version. Then there are characters who are going to be in the movie but just never made the cut. For example, Popeye was going to be in the movie, as seen here in some storyboards of him hanging out with Goofy. And Judge Doom was going to have a bigger gang of Toon villains, including a Toon Vulture, which sat on his shoulder, which incidentally still had a figurine made of it, and a fearsome courthouse jury of Toon Kangaroos. A law and order system led by kangaroos? In other words, the current justice system in Australia. Number six, Warner Brothers wanted their cut. Who Framed Roger Rabbit was quite revolutionary back in the day, for featuring both Warner Brothers Looney Tune characters and famous Disney characters. However, Warners were worried that their characters were going to be background characters to the Disney ones, mainly down to the fact that the movie was being released by Disney. So to keep Warners happy, Looney Tunes characters were promised to have as much screen time as the Disney characters, which is why we would often see major Disney and Warner Brothers cartoons show up at the same time. For example, the scene where Donald Duck and Daffy Duck are playing their pianos, and the scene where we see both Mickey Mouse and Bugs Bunny skydiving. Yeah, about that scene. Many people claim that Bugs Bunny subtly gives Mickey the finger. Hmm, I don't know. Maybe. Ain't I a stinker? Number five, Roger Rabbit was going to die in an early draft. I already mentioned that the book the movie is based on is pretty dark and grim and revolves around the death of its main character, Roger Rabbit. However, Roger nearly met his maker in the movie adaptation too, because for whatever reason, writers really seem to have it out for this poor rabbit, as an early draft of the script would see Roger die, to which the Sting song, The Lazarus Heart, would be played over his death scene. Um, okay, that's pretty random. You see, here's the thing. In the movie, Roger turns out to be such a lovable character. Just imagine how traumatized those kids who saw the film would have been in knowing that this cartoon character they fell in love with had died. Wow, talk about putting the little ones in therapy. Also, in an early draft of the movie, there was going to be a big shock twist, which would have revealed Jessica Rabbit and Baby Herman to be the villains of the movie. Once again, weird. Number four, casting possibilities. In 
It was during the casting process of the movie that legendary British screen actor Tim Curry auditioned for the role of Judge Doom. But his performance was considered too frightening by Robert Zemeckis and Steven Spielberg. Wow, just imagine how awesome Curry would have been in the role. Christopher Lloyd's portrayal was already pretty freaky, so I can only imagine just how terrifying Curry's rendition of the character was. Hey, don't worry about not getting the role, Tim Curry. You still got a scary child-eating clown role coming your way. A few years later down the track after Who Framed Roger Rabbit. Also, both Spielberg and Zemeckis' number one choice for Eddie Valiant was Bill Murray. But he wasn't hired simply because Zemeckis and Spielberg couldn't track him down. Robert Zemeckis said in a newspaper interview that they wanted Murray, but just couldn't get in contact with him. And when Murray read the interview, he started yelling and screaming, despite the fact that he was in a public place, as he would have loved to have starred in the movie. Oh well, I guess he was too busy taking on Vigo at the time. So... If only Bill Murray didn't leave his phone off the hook, then he might have starred in Who Framed Roger Rabbit. Then again, Bob Hoskins was perfect in the role, and nothing can replace good old Bob. Number three, who bought the Roger Rabbit merch? As you would imagine, there was a variety of merchandise associated with Who Framed Roger Rabbit. First of all, there were these flexible figurines. You know, those ones that you can bend. But I remember these types of figurines weren't really popular with the kids at the time because the bendiness doesn't last too long and the bendy figures always looked kind of weird. There was a lineup of standard Roger Rabbit solid action figurines and I can remember getting Roger Rabbit one Christmas and I was so excited. I got him out of his packaging and pulled his arm down which was sitting up in the packaging and just like that, the arm broke off, and I was heartbroken. Good one, LJN. No wonder the angry video game nerd hates you so much. Speaking of which, then there was the Nintendo game, where you play as Eddie Valiant, and you're walking around trying to solve puzzles and clues while avoiding the weasels. The gameplay was long, boring, and tedious, with near dysfunctional driving levels. Then there was the Game Boy game, which surprisingly was actually a lot better than the Nintendo version. This time you play as Roger, and your main objective is to save Jessica Rabbit after she gets kidnapped by Judge Doom. And Roger must go to Doom's mansion and kill him. And that is literally the main objective. Hell yeah, go Roger, you kill that bad guy. Then there was the board game, Dip Flip. I don't know anything about this, so... um. Yeah, dip flip. Uh, yeah, remember in the early 90s when all the kids were playing dip flip? Yeah, that's right, I don't either. Remember me, Eddie? When I killed your brother, I talked just like <laughs> Number two, the story is somewhat based on fact. In Who Framed Roger Rabbit, Judge Doom's evil plan is to dismantle the red car trolley in order to build a freeway. This somewhat represents a practice that took place in the early 40s, where corporations tried to dismantle the public transit in order to force people into buying motor vehicles. It is also further claimed that the story of corporate corruption involving the removal of the public transit was the script for the abandoned sequel to the movie Chinatown, which was going to be called Cloverleaf as in Cloverleaf, the company seen in Who Framed Roger Rabbit. And the writers of Who Framed Roger Rabbit, Jeffrey Price and Peter S. Seaman, are both self-proclaimed fans of the movie Chinatown, and thus were working off the script of the abandoned sequel. So let me get this right. When we watch Who Framed Roger Rabbit, what we are really watching is the sequel to Chinatown. Shh, do you hear that? Do you hear that? Listen. Yeah, that's right. That is the sound of my mind being blown. Number one, the first screening audience hated it. For nobody else. 
at the time, Who Framed Roger Rabbit was the most expensive thus far in the 1980s, with a whopping budget of 70 million. So it must have come as a hard blow when the first batch of test audiences did not like the movie. In fact, they hated it. Well, this is because the first screening consisted of 18 to 19 year olds, and clearly the wrong demographic for the film. I mean, come on, these guys were in their late teens. No wonder they didn't like the film. 18 to 19 year olds don't want to watch movies about Mickey Mouse, Bugs Bunny and Dumbo. They want to see Jason Voorhees running around killing people. The thing is, Who Framed Roger Rabbit went on to become such a treasured classic, so it's really kind of hard to imagine that its first public response was a negative one. Nevertheless, the film went on to make $328.8 million. That's a lot of dosh. So the tension after the first screening no doubt would have been short-lived. So that was my exploration into Roger Rabbit. I hope you enjoyed it, and remember, you should never judge an entire species of tunes. You can't judge all of them based on the actions of one of them. Otherwise, unfair discrimination and prejudices are formed. Anyway, I'm Minty, and... Oh no! I'm a tune!